The Human Cycle by Sri Aurobindo Chapter 1 The Cycle of Society To them this symbol of the Creator's body was more than an image. It expressed a divine reality. Human society was for them an attempt to express in life the cosmic Purusha, who has expressed himself otherwise in the material and the superphysical universe. Man and the cosmos are both of them symbols and expressions of the same hidden reality. From this symbolic attitude came the tendency to make everything in society a sacrament, religious and sacrosanct, but as yet with a large and vigorous freedom in all its forms, a freedom which we do not find in the rigidity of, quote, savage communities, because these have already passed out of the symbolic into the conventional stage, though on a curve of degeneration instead of a curve of growth. The spiritual idea governs all. The symbolic religious forms which support it are fixed in principle. The social forms are lax, free, and capable of infinite development. One thing, however, begins to progress towards a firm fixity, and this is the psychological type. Thus, we have first the symbolic idea of the four orders, expressing, to employ an abstractly figurative language, which the Vedic thinkers would not have used, nor perhaps understood, but which helps our modern understanding, the divine as knowledge in man, the divine as power, the divine as production, enjoyment, and mutuality, the divine as service, obedience, and work. These divisions answer to four cosmic principles, the wisdom that conceives the order and principle of things, the power that sanctions, upholds, and enforces it, the harmony that creates the arrangement of its parts, the work that carries out what the rest direct. Next, out of this idea, there developed a firm but not yet rigid social order, based primarily upon temperament and psychic type, with a corresponding ethical discipline, and secondarily upon the social and economic function. The psychic type as guna and the economic function as karma. But as the function was determined by its suitability to the type and its helpfulness to the discipline, it was not the primary or sole factor. The first the symbolic stage of this evolution is predominantly religious and spiritual. The other elements, psychological, ethical, economic, physical, are there, but subordinated to the spiritual and religious idea. The second stage, which we may call the typal, is predominantly psychological and ethical. All else, even the spiritual and religious, is subordinate to the psychological idea and to the ethical ideal which expresses it. Religion becomes then, 
a mystic sanction for the ethical motive and discipline, dharma. That becomes its chief social utility, and for the rest it takes a more and more otherworldly turn. The idea of the direct expression of the divine being or cosmic principle in man ceases to dominate or to be the leader and in the forefront. It recedes, stands in the background, and finally disappears from the practice and in the end, even from the theory of life. This typal stage creates the great social ideals which remain impressed upon the human mind even when the stage itself is past. The principal active contribution it leaves behind when it is dead is the idea of social honor, the honor of the Brahmin, which resides in purity, in piety, in a high reverence for the things of the mind and spirit, and a disinterested possession and exclusive pursuit of learning and knowledge, the honor of the Kshatriya, which lives in courage, chivalry, strength, a certain proud self-restraint and self-mastery, nobility of character and the obligations of that nobility, the honor of the Vaisha, which maintains itself by rectitude of dealing, mercantile fidelity, sound production, order, liberality, and philanthropy, the honor of the Shudra, which gives itself in obedience, subordination, faithful service, a disinterested attachment. But these more and more cease to have a living root in the clear psychological idea or to spring naturally out of the inner life of the man. They become a convention, though the most noble of conventions. In the end, they remain more as a tradition in the thought and on the lips than a reality of the life. For the typal passes naturally into the conventional stage. The conventional stage of human society is born when the external supports, the outward expressions of the spirit or the ideal, become more important than the ideal, the body, or even the clothes more important than the person. Thus, in the evolution of caste, the outward supports of the ethical fourfold order, birth, economic function, religious ritual and sacrament, family custom, each began to exaggerate enormously its proportions and its importance in the scheme. At first, birth does not seem to have been of the first importance in the social order, for faculty and capacity prevailed. But afterwards, as the type fixed itself, its maintenance by education and tradition became necessary and education and tradition naturally fix themselves in a hereditary groove. Thus, the son of a Brahmin came always to be looked upon conventionally as a Brahmin. Birth and profession were together the double bond of the hereditary convention at the time when it was most firm and faithful 
to its own character. This rigidity once established, the maintenance of the ethical type passed from the first place to a secondary or even a quite tertiary importance. Once the very basis of the system, it came now to be a not indispensable crown or pendant tassel insisted upon by the thinker and the ideal code maker, but not by the actual rule of society or its practice. Once ceasing to be indispensable, it came inevitably to be dispensed with, except as an ornamental fiction. Finally, even the economic basis began to disintegrate. Birth, family custom, and remnants, defamations, new accretions of meaningless or, or fanciful religious sign and ritual, the very scarecrow and caricature of the old profound symbolism, became the riveting links of the system of caste in the Iron Age of the old society. In the full economic period of caste, the priest and the pundit masquerade under the name of the Brahmin, the aristocrat and feudal baron under the name of the Kshatriya, the trader and money-getter under the name of the Vaishya, the half-fed laborer and economic serf under the name of the Shutra. When the economic basis also breaks down, then the unclean and diseased decrepitude of the old system has begun. It has become a name, a shell, a sham, and must either be dissolved in the crucible of an individualist period of society, or else fatally affect with weakness and falsehood the system of life that clings to it. That invisible fact is the last and present state of the caste system in India. The tendency of the conventional age of society is to fix, to arrange firmly, to formalize, to erect a system of rigid grades and hierarchies, to stereotype religion, to bind education and training to a traditional and unchangeable form, to subject thought to infallible authorities, to cast a stamp of finality on what seems to it the finished life of man. The conventional period of society has its golden age when the spirit and thought that inspired its forms are confined but yet living, not yet altogether walled in, not yet stifled to death and petrified by the growing hardness of the structure in which they are cased. That golden age is often very beautiful and attractive to the distant view of posterity by its precise order, symmetry, fine social architecture, the admirable subordination of its parts to a general and noble plan. Thus, at one time, the modern literature, artist, or thinker looked back often with admiration and with something like longing to the medieval age of Europe. He forgot in its distant appearance of poetry, nobility, spirituality, the much folly, ignorance, 
iniquity, cruelty, and oppression of those harsh ages, the suffering and revolt that simmered below these fine surfaces, the misery and squalor that was hidden behind that splendid facade. So too the Hindu Orthodox idealist looks back to a perfectly regulated society, devoutly obedient to the wise yoke of the Shastra, and that is his golden age, a nobler one than the European, in which the apparent gold was mostly hard-burnished copper with a thin gold leaf covering it, but still of an alloyed metal, not the true Satya Yuga. In these conventional periods of society, there is much indeed that is really fine and sound and helpful to human progress, but still they are its copper age, and not the true golden. They are the age when the truth we strive to arrive at is not realized, not accomplished. The Indian names of the golden age are Satya, the age of the truth, and Krita, the age when the law of the truth is accomplished. But the exiguity of it, eked out, or its full appearance imitated by an artistic form, and what we have of the reality has begun to fossilize and is doomed to be lost in a hard mass of rule and order and convention. For always the form prevails and the spirit recedes and diminishes. It attempts indeed to return, to revive the form, to modify it, anyhow to survive, and even to make the form survive. But the time tendency is too strong. This is visible in the history of religion. The efforts of the saints and religious reformers became progressively more scattered, brief, and superficial in their actual effects, however strong and vital the impulse. We see this recession in the growing darkness and weakness of India in her last millennium. The constant effort of the most powerful spiritual personalities kept the soul of the people alive, but failed to resuscitate the ancient free force and truth and vigor, or permanently revivify a conventionalized and stagnating society. In a generation or two, the iron grip of that conventionalism has always fallen on the new movement and annexed the names of its founders. We see it in Europe in the repeated moral tragedy of ecclesiasticism and Catholic monasticism. Then there arrives a period when the gulf between the convention and the truth becomes intolerable, and the men of intellectual power arise, the great swallowers of formulas, who, rejecting robustly or fiercely, or with the calm light of reason, symbol and type and convention, strike at the walls of the prison house, and seek by the individual reason, moral sense, or emotional desire, the truth that society has lost or buried in its whited sepulchres. 
It is then that the individualistic age of religion and thought and society is created. The age of Protestantism has begun. The age of reason, the age of revolt, progress, and freedom. A partial and external freedom, still betrayed by the conventional age that preceded it, into the idea that the truth can be found in outsides, dreaming vainly that perfection can be determined by machinery, but still a necessary passage to the subjective period of humanity, through which man has to circle back towards the recovery of his deeper self, and a new upward line, or a new revolving cycle of civilization.